excited about the things that are happening in our church. If you haven't come to events to meet the people in the church, you need to come and visit, uh, visit the youth group, visit the kids group. Come on Sunday mornings. We're going over a class. It's fantastic. You get to know a lot about the church. So if you haven't had the opportunity, please come and ask questions. We want to help you. We want to help you grow in your faith. And we want to help you get where God has a place for you. So with that being said, if we can open up our Bibles. And we're going to read a scripture this morning. And it's going to be on First uh, John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. So I'm going to ask you to stand up so we can read the Bible, but I'll give you a couple of seconds so you can look it up in your phone app or your Bible, and we can read it and we can get started. Sounds good? Amen? You're a little quiet this morning. Yes, it's First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And you know, when I was uh, praying and asking God for guidance for the week, and the event that we had with the youth yesterday, God was spoken to me about love and how many people don't celebrate uh, the day of 14, uh, Valentine's Day. Some people say that it's a pagan day. Well, in reality, if you read your Bible and you go into the book of East Esther, you're going to find out that we as Christians should celebrate Valentine's, but not because of the day that the calendar or the stores make it to be, but in reality it's to celebrate the love God has for us. So with that being said, I came across with this verse, which is uh, 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, and it says like, so, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you because you have brought us over here today. And for those of uh, that are watching online, God, I thank you because they're listening with a purpose. They are looking for you, just as I am looking for you. And we are looking for that love that we don't understand, but we know that it's there. And we probably will never comprehend how much and how big your love is for us, God. But all we can do is accept it. And we give you thanks and we give you honor. And we thank you for all the things that you have done for us and for all the people. Lord, I know there's some people looking for answers. I know there's some people looking for healing. I know some people are just asking questions. And God, it's only through your love that we can find that peace and we can find that understanding for any situation that we might be going through. I just thank you for this beautiful day. I'll thank you for the music that we're about to worship you. And I just thank you for everything that you do in our lives. Please send your Holy Spirit and let us feel you in a different way this morning, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, it's greeting time. Why don't you uh, find someone and tell them uh, that you're glad they're here. Also, uh, try not to let the Super Bowl divide you today. So greet someone. Tell them you're glad to see them. Well, hey, let me invite you to come back to your seats. We've got a whopper of an announcement time this morning, so we don't want you to, to miss out on what's going on in the life of your church. Um, tonight, Super Bowl watch party, 530. Join us right here. We're going to um, leave some of these chairs in here this morning, and we're going to set it up. And if you can come and still love Jesus and watch the game, uh, we want you to come and do that here. If you can't come and love Jesus and still watch the game, then you're probably like a Eagles fan or something, but <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, also next Sunday, February 19th is Alabaster Sunday, so start gathering your, all your coins up that you've been saving, and we want to just uh, keep supporting that awesome ministry that provides housing and um, churches and schools and hospitals, basically any kind of building in the Church of Nazarene that's um, uh, contributed with your nickels and dimes, you put them together, uh, and, and we're able to build buildings. But guess what? Did you know that if you wanted to put bills in there, you could put bills? We're going to have the offering right up here, and you can, you can put bills in there. You could even drop a check 
Um, I don't know. I bet a gold bar would work if you put it in there. If it's, it can fit through the slot anyway. Um, we're going to have an Ash Wednesday service, February 22nd. So we have Wednesday night church um, from 6 to 8. We have a meal first, and then uh, by 7 we're going into a Bible study and, or different activities for different ages. Um, but this Wednesday, uh, the 20, um, the Wednesday the 22nd, we're going to be all together. We're going to have a special Ash Wednesday service, and we'll be um, probably in the Phase 2 area. But I want to invite you to come to that. If you don't normally come to Wednesday Night Church, uh, this is a special event. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have you anytime, but uh, you won't want to miss this uh, as well. Um, just a, another reminder that we're having our annual church meeting, what we're calling our Vision Sunday on the 26th. We're going to be electing people to different positions. We're going to be hearing what the Lord has done over the year and what we hope the Lord continues to do over the coming year. Um, and as an added remind, or a added bonus to that, you might be thinking, well, church might be a little longer. I promise it won't be much longer. We did this successfully last year, and we got out right around the same time. But if you're thinking, you know, what if, what if the Baptists beat us to lunch and we'll have to wait too long? Or what if the Methodists fill up my favorite spot? Guess what? The teens have a solution for you. They're going to be cooking some hamburgers so that you can just do that now. There's probably going to be a chance to pre-order those if you want. So uh, make sure you're here for that next week. If not, you can probably pick one up on the spot, no problem either. So just keep that in mind. Um, also, final, final announcement uh, relates to the teens as well. Uh, they're having a garage sale March 3rd and 4th right here at the church. This is part of a fundraiser that they're doing. If you've got junk, and well, I know you have junk at your house. You've got junk at your house, you're thinking, why do I still have this? Bring it over to the church, we'll find a place to stack it, you can clean your, your house out, and uh, it'll go towards a good cause, um, and uh, we can probably even make donation letters available if you need those as well. So, um, I think that's all for announcements. We did it. Um, I want to invite you in this time, go ahead and stand up and prepare your hearts to continue in worship.
this morning about five minutes ago that uh, you don't have notes in the app. Um, you can certainly open up a note app on your phone or take notes in pers- uh, on paper if that's what you normally do anyway. Um, I, we got a new, new technology soft. We got some new technology software and I spent a lot of time there in the week setting that up uh, or trying to set it up or figure it out and I realized as we were sitting here, man, I spent so much time doing that I didn't get the notes written down for you. But don't worry, I promise we still have a message today even if the notes aren't there. Um, I mean, even myself, I didn't have it pulled up. Um, Just want to remind you also that even though um, you might not use the app on a regular basis, I want to encourage you to consider doing so. It's the best place to go for um, up-to-date announcements. Um, that we'll be sending out uh, a little more faithfully weekly through the app. If you're forgetting, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on on Sunday. If you didn't get all the announcements, we'll get some of the more pertinent ones uh, starting on Mondays weekly. It's also, if you missed a service, you can get into the app and check that out uh, and get back on the service there. We normally post it Monday or Tuesday by the latest. Um, and then finally, um, it just simplifies your giving. Again, if you want to give and you're not here or if you're at home and you realize I didn't give, bam, you get on the app and you can do that. Um, definitely, you can give on, uh, in person in the boxes at the back or some other way 
um, by mail or however um, you've been doing it. But I um, just want to encourage you to use that as a resource. You don't have to use it. We'll keep doing all the other things if you're just like, that's not for me. But if you want to be in the most up-to-date place, that's the place for you to go. Um, hey, we made it. This is uh, our last Money Matters sermon uh, in the, in the series. So we've been talking about money. Yes, uh, these are matters that concern money, but also what we do with our money matters. This is what we're calling it, money matters. Uh, we've talked about giving as a faithful response to God's goodness, giving as a way to fund the mission of the kingdom, right? God is up to stuff, and he wants to do it through um, the means that he's provided for us. We also want to give as an expression of mercy and compassion. That's what we talked about last week, that uh, we have to make space in ourselves, whether we give of our time, our energy, our expertise, our finances, the shirt off our back, uh, the food from our cupboard, whatever it is, uh, we have to be giving. And that comes from, from us. And, and, and again, uh, one of the things we repeated throughout, uh, nothing comes from nothing, right? God created the earth, uh, the heavens and the earth and the entire cosmos. He did that from nothing. But since that time, everything else comes from something. When God's going to work, uh, he's going to decide he's going to feed 5,000 people, 5,000 men, maybe 10, 12,000 people. He says, hey, what do we have? And the disciples are kind of embarrassed, right? And they say, well, we got the boy with the fish, right? Nothing comes from nothing. He takes that fish and he feeds all those people. So today, then, we're talking about giving as a way to reorder the universe. You realize that when you give your money freely to the cause of the kingdom of heaven, you are reordering your, your own priorities and you're reordering the priorities of the world around us. So that's what we're going to speak about today. Um, doing something a little bit different, uh, we're not... Um, uh, especially since we don't have notes, it ends up being okay as well. But uh, we're going to eventually, in just a moment, not right now, we're going to read three different passages of Scripture, and we're going to talk about them separately, and then you'll see how they come together at the end. Uh, but before we go to the Scripture, I want to give you the big idea. Um, even though you don't have your notes, you can keep this big idea in mind. In Christ Jesus, God has turned the world upside down. One of the most visible aspects of this upside-down kingdom is the use of resources who they belong to, and why they exist are at stake. Um, I know that in my own life, I've been proud of things that I have accomplished. And I've said, wow, look at what I've done. And look at, or look at what I've gained. Look at what I've earned. And, and we take a moment, we say, wow, look at all those things that I did. I'm so good. And you might be like me, you might sometimes just be in awe of yourself. Hopefully not as, not, I'm not really so bad about that. But I mean, sometimes we, we take credit for things and we just feel so great and we forget all of God's grace that's just abundantly lavished upon us and allowed us to be where we're at. And, 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 and recognizing that those things come from a gracious heavenly father also reorders our lives so that we can say, okay, if those things, all the things that I have, whether it's possessions or influence or standing, my, my position at work, my position in the community, all these things I might have, the family that I have, all these things I can think of that, that are a part of me and, and, and who I am and, and, and how I'm existing in this world, if I recognize that God gave me those things, then, then I have to at the same time recognize that they don't necessarily all belong to me. And that's the hard thing, right? God gave me these kids, and I get to raise these kids, and these are my kids, and look how good I did. They're such perfect kids, and I'm so great. Um, but eventually, at some point, I have to say, Lord, these children belong to you. I haven't had to kick any kids out of my house yet. Um, mine, mine are still school age, and they're still at home, and I'm happy about that. But I know it's going to be a difficult day when the time comes and I say, Lord, I'm just setting these kids out into the world. They belong to you, and I know that you're going to take care of them, and you're going to continue to bless their life and, and give them grace as you've done. And, and that's a hard thing. Specifically then about money, what's so hard is we receive us. Look at all these things that God has blessed me, and now I have this money, and, and I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to use it like it's all mine even though the Lord is saying, I own this. Even though it's in your pocket or in your bank account, it's, it's mine. I gave it to you. And guess what? We don't want this to happen, but guess what? The Lord could take it away. You can lose money in a heartbeat. And I think that in order for us to continue to receive things, we have to be good stewards of what the Lord has given us, whether we're speaking about our home, uh, whether we're speaking about our, our church finances, um, or 
in any kind of organization that we belong in, if we're not good stewards of what we received, um, and that includes children and, 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 and all these other things that we have that we consider things that we receive from the Lord, um, if that's the case, then if we're going to continue to receive them and continue to get to, to use them for God's purposes, then we have to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to use them the way you want me to use them. I'm going to give them back to you. Um, and this is a contrary, countercultural thing to realize that what I have, it might be mine. I might get to control over it. Uh, in the same way that Adam and Eve um, were given dominion over the garden, right? And then God said, you get to control this. It wasn't a question, well, whose does it belong to? Is this Adam's tree or Eve's tree or God's tree? Who, I wonder whose it was. Now, this donkey over here or this, this sheep or this this, uh, I don't know, what's another creature? This naked mole rat. Whatever it is, does this belong to me or to my wife or, or, or to, to my God? I don't know. That wasn't in question. It all belonged to God. Everything in the garden belonged to God. Then, now, and every day that will come in the future, everything belongs to God. And if we believe that, then we have to be willing to say, okay, when God wants me to do this, then I'll do this with that part. If God wants me to do this with this part, then I'll give that away. If it's time to bring in the harvest, if it's time to slaughter an animal, whatever example we use from the garden, whatever that is, if God's asking us to do it, we have to do it. And this is a countercultural world upside down thing where we say, even what I have in my house doesn't belong to me. Okay, so let's look at Psalm 24. We're just gonna look at two verses. We all love Psalm 23. It's one of our favorites, right? Um, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, and, 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 and you probably have that memorized. But here's the very next part uh, after that psalm. Um, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. This comes out of a very painful time for David. Um, you can imagine what it would be like to be anointed as king. He, you, you, first of all, you're a child in a field uh, fighting off wild animals. And, 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 and God brings someone to your house and they anoint you as king and you're just kind of basically a child there he, yeah he had done the the thing and you know he by the way he killed that giant guy it just kind of happened and then he just went back home and and was doing his thing and and he gets anointed i mix that up he does the giant after i believe but uh so you think about david and, and he's there and and he's just a, a kid and he gets anointed and, and then eventually he, he, he does uh, kill Goliath, and eventually he's, he's kind of raised up, and he's brought into to Saul's home, who is the current king and still alive. And he's in his home, and then eventually Saul tries to kill him, right? And David is fleeing for his life, and he's living with some of the enemies of the people of God just because they're scared of him. They respect him. This guy is a soldier, a warrior. We're not going to mess with him. He can live in our area because uh, maybe um, if... The Israelites are scared of the strength of David's as we are, then maybe they won't bother us if he's living amongst us. So David is in this in-between time where he's like, but I'm supposed to be king of Israel. And here I am, I'm not king of Israel. And so he, and then not only that, he continually gives love and, and, and kindness and gentleness to Saul. And Saul throws spears. Saul goes hunting and he's not hunting for men, he's hunting for David. Saul is actively trying to kill him. And you can imagine out of the depths of his heart, he's praying this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, and, and, and all the care that I get. And the very next psalm, the very next poem that he writes down in, in, in his worship, a worship to the Lord, David's like, I guess I have to realize that all of this belongs to God. And if I'm going to be king, I'm going to be king in the way that God wants me to be king. And if I think whatever possession I should have as king, whether it's homes or wealth or security or family or money, whatever it is, I'm going to give that back to the Lord. Because what I recognize is it all belongs to God. He founded the earth on the seas, on the waters. That's a funny way of looking at it. But in the Jewish mindset, water was nothing. Water was chaos. Water was unknown. We don't know what it is. It's nothing. And so in their mind, actually, uh, that existed um, in the beginning time. So God is the one who comes into the chaos of the world, into the scary part of the world, and God sets the earth in there. God blesses the earth. God fills the earth, and he blesses it again. He creates humankind. He sends it out. And guess what? Everything that happens belongs to God. 
So that's an important thing that we've got to keep in mind as, as followers, followers of Christ today, that everything in this world belongs to God. Instead of saying, I get what I'm owed, um, David says, I realize that I am just, you know, sometimes I'm going to have more uh, available to me. Sometimes I'm going to get to be a part of uh, um, ruling, uh, but it's going to be on God's terms and God's way. Instead of saying, this is mine, this belongs to me, I deserve this, he says, I understand this belongs to the Lord, and whatever comes my way, or whatever comes to me, I'm going to just have to deal with. So the word, that's the word, uh, or the sign of change that we see then. And so the word for today, modern believers, we might say, yes, everything belongs to God, and we're just stewards of what we receive. That's hard to think about. If you look at the money in your bank account, man, I'm just a steward of that. The truth is, eventually, whether you save every penny or, or you spend it all, you're just a steward of it. And the reason is because one day you will die, and you do not get to take that with you. So it might, you might say, okay, well, I'm going to save it. It's going to go to my family members, and then they will be stewards of it. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. That, that happens. Um, and, and hopefully, they, um, you and, 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 and you pass on, uh, you might have an understanding where God is uh, all your finances, all the things, all your clothes, all your vehicles, all your technology, all your appliances in your house, everything that exists, your house itself, all those things belong to the Lord. And you hope that maybe you pass that on to the generations that follow you that have the same understanding. And if that's the case, then um, you realize, one, we can't take anything with us. And we don't want to let um, our legacy be the stuff that gets left behind. Because the next thing we know will be in the presence of the Lord. Some argument amongst Christians about when you go to be with the Lord, but the truth is, after you die, whether, whenever that period is, the next thing you know, you'll be with the Lord. He's not going to say, wow, look at, look at all the stuff you have, man. You're awesome. You lived a great life. He's going to say, how did you spend your time here on earth? Did you know me? And how did you show it? Did you live like I wanted you to live? And yes, some of that involves giving. Uh, I don't want to say that it all involves giving. But that's a big part of it. And that's the hardest part for us to do is to surrender our finances or our possessions to the will of the Lord. So that when God says, hey, I need this thing, that we're so freely uh, willing and able to give. And it's hard. You know, I, sometimes being a pastor is hard because you're like, maybe the Lord's testing me with these sermons. So in these last four weeks, I will tell you, more people have approached me randomly asking me for money than I've ever had before. <laughs> I was walking out of Lowe's the other day, and there's this group there, and they're like, hey, excuse me, sir, um, we have this organization here, and we're raising money for Habitat for Humanity, and we, I said, you know, I don't have any cash. Do you have a way to give to, you know, digitally? And they're all like, oh, no, we don't. And someone out of the back, yes. I'm like, oh, rats. <laughs> you know, no, I'm teasing. But, um, you know, we had people, um, I, I just have people showing up, and, and, and again, I'm not saying that to be Christian means to give to every person who asks us to give to them. That's, that's not what being Christian means. And I think that's what being generous means. Um, there might be good aspects of that and, and, and bad aspects of that, but uh, that's not the message is not give everything to every person who asks for you, from you. But still, at some point, what I recognize, and, and the Lord is putting me to the test, is that I have a chance to be generous. I have a chance to, to use what the Lord has given me more than just my own comfort and security and supporting my own ideas of, okay, this ministry, that ministry. Sometimes something might be presented. And you end up giving and, and, and sacrificing in order to be able to do that. Let's move on. I'm going to talk too long on this one. Um, let's move to Luke uh, chapter 20. Um, we'll just read six verses here. Great. Um, Luke 20, verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be honest in order to trap him by what he said and then to hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, we know that you are right in what you say and teach, and you show deference to no one but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful for us to pay tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness. This is speaking about Jesus. He perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose head and whose title does it bear? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to trap him by what he said. 
and being amazed by his answer, they became silent. This is one that we've heard uh, so often in Scripture, and I've heard it used in ways that I think are faithful to the message here, and I've heard it used in ways that weren't faithful. Um, I've heard it used uh, in ways for people to say, well, only a tenth of what I have belongs to the Lord, therefore I give a tenth, and I don't give any more. Or they say, um, you know, this part is my personal thing, and, and it has my, uh, my image or my... my um, um, my likeness on it, or I, I, something that I worked for and I earned, therefore it's mine. I don't have to give it to the Lord. Um, and rather, um, what I believe this passage is telling us is, is you can't get away from things that belong to the Lord. It all belongs to the Lord in accordance with Psalm 24 as well. And here's why. So this passage comes, they're, trying to, they're, they're continually trying to trap Jesus. He starts getting really pointed, really direct. We're going to we're going to make sure these guys know that, that the way they're living isn't the right way. And he's, he knows that the further he goes at calling them out, the further he exposes them at their hypocrisy and their lack of faith, the more he does that, he knows every time he does that, he's stepping one step closer to the cross. Every time he traps them, tricks them, embarrasses them, gives them the truth that they weren't willing to hear, to hear um, convicts them, uh, condemns them, judges them, passes judgment on them. Every time Jesus does that, he knows he's step, t- stepping one uh, step closer to the cross. And he just continues to do this. So now he touches the money issue, right? So if you watched The Chosen, it gives a good image of that dichotomy between um, the Romans and the, the Jews, right? The occupying army and the Jewish people and how much they hated each other. But not only that, they hated even more the tax collectors, the people who were the intermediaries, right? So the tax collectors were people who were appointed by the Romans to go collect money from the Jewish people and bring it back to the Romans. For them, there was no way that they were allowed to do this. You could not give money to the Romans. But because they're forcing us, we'll give it to the tax collectors. Because the Romans were smart, too. They knew that they had an issue with this. So they appointed these tax collectors. If, if I give my money to the tax collector tax collector goes and gets to the Romans, I'm not sinning. Only the tax collector, right? Because he's giving it away to the Romans. So we hate this guy, but we need this guy. Otherwise, you know, maybe the Romans will come and kill us or something. And so um, you see that portrayed in the character of Matthew in, in the Chosen series, if you've watched that at all. And so you have this thing going on where they need this system to work, but they absolutely hate each other. And what they know is, okay, Jesus is speaking against us, we're not really allowed, you know, we're God's people. We're not really allowed to kill people. That's not really our thing. We're, there's no, we're only allowed to kill people if they're caught in several types of sin. And then we can take them out and stone them. And, um, but the people love him. People are never going to stone Jesus. Every time he speaks, they just, they just love him. He heals them. He does miracles for them. So how are we going to trap him? How are we going to trick him? So they go to the political side, right? They go to the political side. So now we ask Jesus, are you allowed to pay taxes to Caesar? Full view of all the passerbys, of all the disciples, and yes, full view of the Romans. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He says, show me a coin. Now here is the funny thing. One of the vital roles of the tax collector was to receive Jewish money. Yes, God's people had their own money. To receive whether they give goats or grain or their Jewish money, they were to receive this and then they would do the exchanging with the Romans and say, here's what this is all worth, here's the taxes. So the fact that these guys who are trying to trap Jesus pull out a coin that has, I don't have a coin in my hand, but uh, a coin that has Caesar's image on it shows that they themselves were dealing in the Roman money. They were a part of this system and right away they are condemned for holding this money. And so we ask the question, well, uh, uh, whose name is on it? Whose head is on it? Okay, that belongs to Caesar. Give Caesar his things. Give God his things. But you know what? If, if, if we change my name for that, give Gavin the things that belong to Gavin and give God the things that belong to God, we know right away, nothing, nothing really belongs to me. Who, who am I? Right? You put your own name in there. You realize that Jesus is saying, yeah, you can give to Caesar whatever you think belongs to Caesar. The truth is, everything belongs to God. So give that back to God. And he says it in such a way that one astounds and, 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 and amazes. The Bible says it amazes the people asking the questions and amazes the crowd and everyone's silent. So money 
is, uh, and Jesus then, he, he, by this uh, conversation or this response to their questioning, Jesus basically says, yes, money is a faith issue. Your possessions are faith issues. If God exists, then money and everything that you possess belongs to God. And so we have to give it back. And that's the hard part, right? But Lord, you just gave this to me. I just got it. I have to give it back. We might not empty our bank account every time a check comes in, right? Or anytime any kind of money ri- arrives in our, in our pocket, we say, okay, I have to give it all to the Lord. But we have to be willing to say, Lord, whenever you call, whatever you ask me to do with this, I'm going to give it to you. And this reorders the world. It did it back when Jesus was uh, living and, and, and walking and, and talking here on earth, and it does so now. When people see us freely giving away towards causes that don't relate to us uh, directly, then people think, what is up with that? I know that, that the church in Nazarene is involved in responding to disasters all over the world, and they do that in countries where they have churches, and they do it in countries where they don't have churches. I know that we have churches in Turkey and in Syria, and you think of the earthquake that just happened there. And I'm certain one of the biggest testimonies to uh, a people who are different in the world is the fact that Nazarenes are already on the ground, they're already sending money, and they're being involved in helping save lives and provide things for people who, who lost everything in the, in the terrible earthquake. And people say, why would you do that? That makes no sense. You don't know us. You, these, we're not your people. In fact, my people don't like your people, and your people don't like my people. Why would you do that? I say, because we serve a God who says, all people are his people. All things are his things, and we can't help but give back to him whenever he asks. And it's a huge testimony to who God is. And so the word from, from Luke chapter 20 to modern believers is, is um, yes, money in the, in the money makes the world go round. This is a popular phrase, right? We use this all the time. Money makes the world go round. Um, uh, but the truth is, or maybe the, the Christian uh, understanding of that is, God makes the world go around, and all things will serve his will. And money is a part of that. People are a part of that. Things are a part of that. The powers and the principalities, governments, kingdoms, and nations, they will all serve the Lord. That's what they will do eventually in the end. And the question is, are we going to be a part of saying, here's what we believe. We believe this belongs to God. I'm going to give it back uh, even now. We still have a few minutes, so we're, we're, we're right on time here. Let's look at Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Now, here's the interesting thing about this is that... Uh, um, this is just a few verses later. So we've had this passage where Jesus uh, condemns those guys or really cast uh, or, or exposes uh, these people for having Roman money like they shouldn't have. They've been involved in things they're not supposed to be involved in. Um, but then he also says, okay, hey, um, not only are they exposed, but just so you know, everything belongs to God. So that happens, and then now we have this uh, other story here. Um, he looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury outside the temple where he's speaking. And then now he looks up and sees people giving their gifts in the treasury. He saw also a poor widow who put in two small copper coins. He said, truly I tell you, this widow has has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has given in all that she had to live on. And, and this is an easy one to understand, I think, for us. You know, um, we, don't, we don't necessarily... <laughs> I've heard about churches that did this, and I thought, man, that would be funny, and I know this would work for us. But uh, there would be, like, um, a list of people who made it into different tiers of giving, right? And so you'd come over, and you'd look, and you'd say, oh, here's my name in the top tier. I gave the most, uh, among the most to the church. And say, wow, oh, wow. And everyone would look and say, wow, look at this family. They're so great. I want to be just like them. And he'd look someone else down there and say, oh, man, my name is down in the lowest tier. I need to do better about giving. Uh, that's uh, probably not uh, what we want to do as a faith community. And I think it goes contrary um, to um, a lot of biblical uh, dynamics as far as uh, uh, money matters, right? And so the issue that's going on here is w- even if we know it's not right, we still sometimes think, man, this person was able to give. That's a great person. They gave so much. And, and what Jesus is saying is, you know, when we give out of what we have left over, 
it doesn't cost us very much, right? When I have a ton of stuff left over uh, and I just give a part of it, even if it's a lot, it, it hasn't necessarily shown my faithfulness. But when I give, regardless of the fact that I have nothing else and I'm able to say, yeah, if these are my last two coins, if these are my last two bills, if this is my last amount of money that I know is supposed to make it to through the end of the month uh, until I get paid again, and I'm willing to give that to the Lord, that's a whole nother uh, example of faith. And even if we try not to, so often we measure, okay, how much did I give? Uh, and we want to compare to other people, or maybe we compare to um, um, our, our past. We say, okay, well, I was able to give more than last year, and that's great, and I encourage you to consider, consider, continue thinking about what you give and how you give. Um, but more money does not right? More possessions given to the kingdom in, in a kind of a way where you just give it over to the church or some charitable organization. Um, it, it's not like you're, there's, a, there's a, a tally sheet uh, and you're getting, you know, your, your, your taxes. Uh, instead of going to the IRS every year, you think about your, your heavenly, uh, I don't know, HRS, Heavenly Revenue Service, and, and, and they're keeping ta- uh, tr- uh, track of that. You think, oh yeah, I'm storing up my treasures in heaven, right? And we say that jokingly sometimes. I'm going to give so that I, I'm going to volunteer. I'm going to work with, I'm going to work with the kids. I'm going to work with the teens. I'm storing up treasures in heaven. Like we're, we're earning this and building up this bank account somewhere else that we'll get to use. And really what's happening is um, we're missing the point. The fact that um, it's not more money, more blessings. It's not I get to earn my place. It's not that I'm earning salvation through the things that I do and the things that I give. Um, it's not even about uh, being a good example. Um, I want to be able to give because I'm giving, because I want to encourage other people to give, which is important. I want to give because giving is important. It helps me say, I don't love things, I love God. I don't love things, I love people. And whenever we give our stuff away, we trick our minds into saying, Yes, I believe this even more. Maybe not trick. We condition our minds to say, yes, I believe this even more. I believe that all this belongs to God, so I can just keep giving freely. And a word to modern believers then from here, I, I believe, is um, everything you have is God's. And don't define yourself by your own standard of generosity. It's always going to be less than God's generosity. Has God been generous to you? Can you say that? Nod your head, at least, if you think God's been generous to you. Yeah, I see some, some heads. Most every head, God's been generous. And if God's been generous to you, do you think God was just sort of like a little bit generous? Like, I'm just going to give a little bit, or maybe I'll give 10% of my generosity. Maybe that'll be enough. Or maybe I'll give, you know, a portion of, I've got a lot of extra generosity, you know, laying around, and I'm just going to give you a, a portion of that. No, God says, I'm going to give you everything. We get all of God's love, all of God's kindness, all of God's grace, all of God's mercy, all of his compassion, all of his justice. We get all of these things. Why would we not want to willingly give it back? Again, one thing thing I've been trying to say throughout this whole series is I'm not asking you to give everything away to the poor and live a pauper's life. Um, we, we kind of studied that scripture a little bit at the beginning where Jesus says, if you follow me, if you want to follow me, give everything you own to the poor and then come follow me. We, we talked about that. Um, you can go back three weeks and find it um, on your app or on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, but what I do think is this is telling us is, is uh, rather that we have to be ready to say, whenever the Lord asks for it, I give it whether it's $10 in my pocket or $10,000 in my pocket, whether it's um, time uh, spent in prayer for someone, time visiting someone, whether it's making use of my home in a way that, that, that blesses somebody else, whether I allow them to stay and I open up my home and give them hospitality, whatever it may be, we have to be willing to give it back to the Lord. So this isn't my house. I live just down the road over here. It's not my house over there. That is the Lord's house that he's entrusted to me for this time. And if I want it to continue being the Lord's house, I have to to be willing to use it however the Lord asks me to use it. Out front of that house, there's a a pickup truck parked there. That's not my truck. I have to to realize the Lord gave it to me. And if I'm going to 
if I'm going to be faithful to my calling to be a Christian, that when the Lord says, I need this for this task, or this reason, this thing, I have to be willing to say, well, well Lord, what about the gas money? Who's going to pay for that? And we turn in our receipts to the Lord and say, I don't have to tithe this much now because uh, you can take it, my gas out of there. No. We say, Lord, if you need it, I'm going to use it. I'm going I'm to let you use it, or I'm going to use it the way you want me to use it. With that said, I want to go ahead and invite the, the worship team to start making their way back up. Um, giving away the things that we have, and this includes money, possessions, uh, family, uh, or at least our, 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 our um, yeah, well, I'll just say family. It um, includes those things. It also includes um, our expectations for what we think uh, life should be. Um, it, it includes our, our, our work time. Um, yes, I've earned my position. I'm in this place, but if the Lord wants me to pivot, the Lord wants me to do something else, will I be willing to follow the Lord and say, yeah, even my vocation, I'll change. If the Lord says, hey, I've been in this, uh, you've been doing this, and, and now I want you to be uh, serving as a, a minister, a marketplace minister in my kingdom, are you going to do that? Or are you going to say, no, not, not at this place. This is my workspace. Let me do that at my church space. So giving to others, giving... Giving to others um, and giving back to God everything that we have ushers in the kingdom little by little every single day. And Jesus came in announcing the arrival of the kingdom, and, and the kingdom has been advancing every single day since then. And we participate in that when we give freely back to God. So we don't worship money. We don't worship, worship possessions. We don't worship things. And when that happens, we're able to give it away more freely. If you're, if you're having a hard time letting something go, whether it's a tangible thing or intangible, if you can't let that go, it might be that that's become an idol for you. Money matters. How we deal with money matters. And so if we're able to give those things away, we testify to the fact that we worship God alone. So the lie that we hear is the more we give, the more we are saved. The more we work, the more we receive. And the truth is, the more we give, the more we resemble Christ. The more we recognize that everything we have, uh, we're just, we just serve as stewards, the more uh, the kingdom comes. Let's pray. Lord, we've been looking at issues of money, matters concerning money. We've been talking about how money does indeed matter for your people and your kingdom. And we hope that, that we don't draw a line in the sand and say, I'm willing to be this generous. I'm willing to give you everything but this. So often we try to separate what belongs to you and us. And Lord, we testify this morning that it all belongs to you. Lord, sometimes we think that we're in control of our destiny and our plan and our life. And we surrender those things to you, Lord. And we say that, We trust your plan. And we'll be stewards of whatever you want us to be stewards of, both as individuals or families and as a church. We'll continue to be good stewards. Lord, we'd have to say that even if you asked us to sell this church and, and, and do something different, hopefully if that was what you were asking, Lord, we would, we would do it, even if it would be difficult. So Lord, help us to realize how you lead us and what you want us to do and who you want us to be. Father, we, we want to be a part of continuing to turn the world upside down and, and say that, that hoarding isn't for us, that building wealth over and over and the competition involved and all those things, that's not your plan for us. But rather, just as you've been exceedingly generous and loving and kind with us, we would be exceedingly generous and loving and kind with others. And they would turn this world upside down and people would say, why would you do that? And we would just testify to who you are. Lord, we pray that you continue to lead us and guide us in these ways for your glory. Amen. Would you stand and continue to worship this final song?
that we can't be anything other than what you have made us first you created us to be something and because of sin we became something else in a broken world we continue to be something else until we give our lives back to you Lord so we pray that we're an empty vessel and you would just pour into us your mercy and your grace that we would be transformed and, and, and into something new that glorifies you and brings honor to you, that our lives are, are a testimony of praise to who you are, Lord. We pray that you would just continue to pour into us abundantly. But at the same time, Lord, if we're a vessel that gets, full, that gets filled up, Lord, we pray that you make us people who are able to pour into others. And everything that you give us, grace, love, mercy, tenderness, kindness, where we continue to pour that into those around us, into your world. Father, whatever you fill us with, our lives with, we recognize that it comes from you and it is yours. 
give us the faith that whenever you call us, whenever you ask us to give, Lord, we give. Whatever you call us, whatever you ask us to be, we will be. To do whatever you call us, whenever you ask us to do, Lord, we will do it. With your help, we trust you, Lord. Transform the world around us, in us first, and then through us next. And we know that you'll be with us every moment of every day. So we thank you and we praise you, Lord. Bless us as we go to be your light in your world. Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. God bless you. Go in his peace this morning.